Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield, and I'm delighted to welcome Matt Dawson, MBE, a strategic sales specialist for the Instant Group and Bell Procurement, a TV and radio star and journalist, a member of the Regional Leadership Committee and a well, health and well-being ambassador for Sodexu, and somebody who works with a whole host of great brands. In a previous life, of course, you're an elite rugby player working as part of the World Cup winning team in 2003, and of course, the British and Irish Lions on three occasions and three tours, and including that iconic try back in 97, amongst other great moments of your career. Matt, you are most welcome today. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's a very generous introduction, David. Thank you very much, and uh, nice to see you again. Nice to catch up, for sure. Yeah, looking forward to chewing the fat, seeing what a grilling I'm going to get. <laughs> I'll be kind, or maybe not. So we are going to talk about elite performance. We're going to talk about reinvention and also transitions between careers and, and the portfolio that you lead. So let's, uh, and perhaps even more, let's start uh, not on rugby, actually. Let's talk about, talk about the corporate world. When you first entered the corporate world, what were your first impressions? And indeed, what, what were the things you found most challenging as part of that new, new venture? Uh, yeah, I, I think there is a slight misconception that, um, that you know, there, there is so many direct correlations between sport and business. And of course, there are plenty, but um, they are also worlds apart in so many areas. And I think because of particularly professional sport is, uh, I mean, wrapped, wrapped in corporate sponsorship advertising identity even the, the clubs themselves are being more and more professional and uh, about making money mm -hmm. um i i was always very keen to get into sort of corporate life even though i had a sort of a uh, the beginnings of a media career corporate was always where i, I wanted to go from playing amateur rugby right uh, and having a a, a job um, as a management trainee in a security firm, it was, I mean, that's where I started my corporate life. I guess, mm. I, I guess the main differences um, that frustrate me would be really some of the very simple things, um, the, the finer detail, the ability to stick to timings, um, mm. or, you know, if you are going to be a little bit late, you know, let people know or, um preparation for meetings preparation for presentations right uh, knowing your target audience analysis all those types of things that are just part of my dna from being a sports person yes to perform at the weekend i, I got a little bit frustrated also about the language of business where I, I felt people often got wrapped up in this corporate language rather than just sort of speaking the english language and, and <laughs> saying what you think and you make yeah it clear. yeah people people uh, hide behind words sometimes because they don't actually know what they are secondly it's just a bit lazy and actually excludes people frankly from the and, conversation and everyone loves an acronym i mean i mean there's plenty of them flying around i don't know what you mean having spent 25 years nearly in a big big corporate organization no i do absolutely <laughs> do. so yeah. i mean if you look at your picture now and i painted a picture of all the different things you do in the corporate space and and, and beyond um and you've touched on them there, but what? How would you describe your, if you like, the strengths that you bring now? Um, you're not here to pitch. I'm not. It's not Dragon's Den. But what would you describe as, <laughs> as the strengths you, you bring? Uh, I, 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 it's funny you ask that because I'm, I'm very conscious of my my background as a, a as a sportsman, not an academic. Didn't go to university. But I like to think that I had a really good understanding, that sort of common sense understanding of people and environment. Mm. Um, and that was magnified and, and sort of tested to the max whilst I was playing elite sport. Mm. Um, so I would say my strengths would be in uh, relationship management, strategic relationships, mm. uh, understanding people, instinct, um, telling and communicating things to people maybe in quite a as a coach once said to me um it's about stabbing people in the belly not in the back <laughs> uh, and they're, 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 those are the, the little phrases that tend to 
resonate with me. Um, yes. And a, a lot of, I mean, even a lot of my seniors, my bosses of the firms that you've mentioned there will, will often have to sort of rein me back a little bit. Um, and I've learned that over time that yeah. you can't necessarily just go in belts and braces and tell people how it is the whole time, but mm. trying to sort of manage that a little bit more because it's not, it's not just going to happen in 80 minutes. You know, the game's, the game's a lot longer. And so yes, you've got to play a that slightly point. longer game. Yes. And how do you, when you're meeting new people, it could be new clients or in, in new opportunities in your portfolio. How do you, if you like, present the identity that you want for yourself, as opposed to perhaps the identity they have of you? Yeah. I, you know, they, they'll know your background. You're a high profile person, but you are you now. You have your own identity. How do you manage those situations where it's like, no, this is me now, not 10 years, five years, 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I have such such mixed receptions when I'm in front of people, when I'm, um, you know, uh, some, sometimes there might, be, there might be a brand on the horizon with one of the companies that I work with that are a dream account. And so I'm like, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go into that business. I'm going to try and find someone that I can connect with who's an appropriate decision maker hmm. um, and strike up an early relationship, maybe talk about that business. The, whether it's on a, you know, a virtual call previously, you know, 18 months previously when you could actually get in front of people, the hmm. amount of times that I would, I, I, from the moment I've walked in the door, I feel I've read them like a book, like they're either into sport and they're going to be all over me and want to talk about sport. Mm. Um, they may have been briefed as to who I am and I've gone the other way, the complete extreme of, right, I'm going to be absolutely awful to this fellow because he thinks that he can get in anywhere because he used to be a sportsman. Oh, right. right, so they're making you, a lot of assumptions this, before you've even met them. Yeah, I mean, you get the, yeah. the, the, full, the full range. And so what I, what I try to do yeah, you know, I've got to get that balance of well, I'm probably in the room, probably in the room because I uh, either you know who I am or someone who knows who I am has has uh, you know referred me to you. Yes. Um, and so I have to manage that with right. This is the here and now. This is what this is what I'm doing. Establish how long I've worked with the firm. Some detail around the business. Get a little bit more corporate for yes. them just to sort of sit back and think. Oh, hold on a minute. Right, the, the 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 sporting bit is maybe going to be a conversation at the end yes. of our chat, yeah. opposed to here's an intro and oh my oh I'm talking to Matt Dawson. Yeah, of course you are going to get those types of conversations, which are fine. But I'm really quite mindful um, of of making sure that the relationship is. I mean, there was there was even one occasion where when I I tend to ask questions and listen rather than talk that that tends to be a strength of mine and when I've posed a couple of questions to um, a potential client I'm then starting to make notes and it's then sending me off in different areas and to the point where through halfway through the meeting he's he said to me oh I'm just I'm so impressed you're actually you know you're not just here to talk about sport you actually sort of know what you're what you're doing and you know it sort of took me a, a little bit uh slightly back but i guess that's the battle that i have to yeah. i have to take on and that style in the meeting where you're you know listening reflecting taking notes not being if you like talking at somebody i guess it's quite a different context to how they may have seen you in in the public life where you are as a commentator or journalist giving pretty forthright views right you have yeah. you, you're outspoken sometimes partly because that's yeah what you think and that's what you feel but it's it's a, a very effective foil and actually shows you in a different light which um shows the range of skills and styles you can bring but let me talk about the port you know the portfolio that you have and have had and you you'll have people coming to you organizations coming to you but either way it's clients in the corporate roles we've discussed but also in the brand and other things you do um you're an individual you manage your own brand and identity i'm sure you have support in doing that how do you how do you filter those opportunities beyond the usual things about money? But how do you look at your yourself as a portfolio and think actually that's a good space to play in? That's the one actually I'm not going to do. How do you how do you work it out? How do you? I, I'm a strategy person by background. What's your strategy? How do you make choices about where you play? Um, I, I think first and foremost the 
I, I tend to look at where I shouldn't play um, and, and areas where I actually feel really comfortable, uh, areas where I can, I know that I can bring some, you know, return on the investment that these people are going to make in, whether it is a brand association, an ambassadorial role, or whether it's a, a client of a, of a corporate. Um, yeah, I... I <laughs> Yeah, I um, you might have to edit that. I've slightly lost my trail of thought. No, but I'll give you an example. For example, you um, you've done just to give you an example, just to play play that we on the a different example, Master Chef years ago, and I'm not just saying that because that's a well known brand. You did brilliant. Well, you won it. I was curious on that opportunity. Obviously, I imagine it's a fun thing to do. I imagine it's very intense. I've actually worked with the production company that made it. How in how intentional were you in that opportunity to think, actually, you know what, that's really good for my band, that's good for back-end deals, books, and so on? Or was it just, hey, that looks like a good thing to do, let's see how it goes? Where were you on that spectrum? Yeah, I, th I, think, the, I think my strategy has always been on what I enjoy, and um, I, tend to, I, I would like to think that I know my limitations, Mm. and I, I am not I'm not known for going into an environment where you know the chances of success are going to be slim you know I, I like to think that I manage my risk yes now <clears throat> one of my one of my strengths is if I enjoy it if I am mentally turned on to it then you get all of that sort of that ex elite sports criteria, mm. you know, in spades. Mm. Uh, and and I've, I've, I found that out with things. Yeah. I mean, that's a good example of the whole reality TV bit. Um, I did Strictly Come Dancing because my grandma loved ballroom dancing. Oh, right. and I thought at the very least, mm. she'll love watching her grandson. Of course, went to, once I got into it and started to understand that actually I might be okay at it, then I'm full ball. Right. Master Chef loved food, loved dining, had a limited um, repertoire. But then a mate of mine was a, um, an exec chef of a, you know, a global uh, restaurant chain. And um, I spoke to him about it and I was halfway through it. He said, come on, why, why don't we, why don't I teach you how to you know, use, a, use a knife properly or to, <laughs> to season products uh, produce or you know all the little nuances that you're never going to know unless you've really been taught by the experts yes. of course that then made me better made me more confident and then whoosh you know i was you was off again and, and same with broadcasting uh, i love doing all the punditry and, and the question sports stuff had a go at presenting on radio and was okay at it uh, and that is a, a very very different skill to being a pundit yes. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't bringing out the best in me. And, you know, I had to make a decision. Am I going to knuckle down and want to be the next John Inverdale, Mark Chapman, Steve Ryder, yes. Gary Lineker, or do I want to be a pundit because I've got all of these things, other things going on. So it, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I am quite critical of myself, but also I think I have a good understanding of when I'm not very good at something even though yeah. the, the, the danger around that is that because of you have profile, people are constantly patting you on the back and saying, yeah. oh, no, you're really good at this, you're really good at that, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing that. Actually having the ability to sort of look at yourself in the mirror and be brutally honest with yourself um, to say, do you know what, actually, I could be spending that time elsewhere in, in an area where I'm really good. That's refreshing to hear. And there's a lot of people in who have, have been you know, in elite roles, sport, music, business, and so on, who don't have that perspective for whatever, for whatever reason. But you talked about intensity in a few occasions there. When you get into something, you really sort of, you know, make it happen. How do you manage yourself in between you know, like moments like that? Because, you know, I see a lot of people who are always on, always switched on. And frankly, at the time, it's fine. But when, you know, you have a dip, or when you get to the end of a particular stage in your career, there's there's you know there's collateral damage or they health. How do you manage your energy and your you feel like the peaks and troughs 
in your in your life and yeah i, I i've um yeah I mean, uh, by no stretch has it been all plain sailing i think because a lot of it gets rolled out in the public domain and people tend to think that everything's hunky-dory you know they might be seeing me on question sport every friday night and thinking oh well his life's amazing but yes yeah i mean i i i'm i'm still have my bouts of adversity whether it's you know divorce illness uh job insecurity um failure you know whatever it is you're still going to suffer from that um but I, I, I'm very philosophical. Um, I'm, I make sure that I surround myself with genuine people, yes. um, which again, in my position, is sometimes quite tricky to do because you know everyone wants to be your mate. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite hard on the vetting of my friends. Yes. Um, and you know, yeah, I do. I, I, I make sure that I play some golf i spend time with the kids uh, you know I, I could be in the middle of the day and think do you know what i need to go and slob on the sofa and watch a rubbish episode of seal team um <laughs> and just completely get rid of the phone and sw- because yeah. we've got social media and you've got yeah, five yeah. different email addresses Lots of from all the businesses. Right? i mean it's coming in from left right and center yeah. and that's difficult to manage because you're i i, I have sort of PAs in three or four of those um, positions. But ultimately, I'm the person who has to perform or appear or say something. And therefore, I've got to have total control over that. So it's not like I can just traditionally, you know, move to a, a PA and say, right, you know, deal with all of my admin, I end up having to do a lot of my admin as well. So there, there is, it is quite phonetic. Hmm. I mean, it's interesting you talk about being philosophical and, and reflective and critical, but also needing some space and, and actually filtering people and opportunities. I mean, I've found within different spaces, of course, but um, I found over the last year, when you move away from a big organization and all the clients and so on, it's not the same level necessarily as you're operating at. But you find out who your friends are and your contacts are when the brand, if you like, goes away. So you know, it goes away. And actually you create new friends, but I think you, I found my filter... And my sort of radar is even more attuned to people who are genuinely interested in you, whether you're having a great day or not a great day, and whether you're giving them generating income for them or not. You know, are they, you know, you need a, a, a nucleus of people who just think you as a person, not as a brand or a name or a title or whatever, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, I um, you know, as an example, you, you, you naturally get that in, in sport or celebrity music, wherever it may be. Um, where you, you, of course, are going to be surrounded by people who want to say that they've met you or have got your phone number or have got a yes. picture with you or have been in a, you know, somewhere we've been to dinner with you, whatever it is. But actually, in you know, the, the big wide world of society and business society, it's exactly the same. You know, a very, very, you know, one of my best friends is an absolute industry leader, CEO of a massive, massive FTSE 100 business. Um, and I've had to have the chat with him to say, you know, it's, this is not, people are going to change around you. You know, yes. people are going to, um, you know, be inviting you left, right and center. You're going to get all the, the tickets and appearances. You're going to get everything, but you know, people will change their perception of you will change. And that's nothing to do with you. That is actually to do with them. Uh, and the, you know, the, I, I always felt that I, I was, if I was true to myself and I kept myself in that, the, you know, in the way that I felt my friends enjoyed, I've got to try and keep that character and mentality going forward. And as I said to this guy, this, you know, you, you're going to notice a change. Your wife and family are going to notice a change, but it's not necessarily you. It's probably derived from the people around you. So make sure that you continue to have the right people around you, even in an environment where you think you're on this roller coaster ride and everything's yes. going to be all hunky dory. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. It's a very good point. I want to just shift gears for a moment to talk about culture. You've been in winning teams throughout all the different roles, obviously, including the sports ones, but business teams, you've had a lot of success. Um, one of the areas I'm fascinated by is how you create winning teams 
in complex sort of situate demanding situations and i'm curious about how you describe the best cultures if you like environments you've been in mm. sort of what's distinguished them and indeed what role you played in some of those just give me a few examples um, I, I suppose if we're grouping them all together, whether it's business and sport, mm. um, similarities, com comparisons across the two would be you know, a, a, a quote from uh, oh, well, yeah, and, and he's a, a guy that I played many, many years of rugby with, Tim Rodber, who's yes. currently my CEO at, um, at Instant. But when I started working with him, this is like seven, eight years ago now, but he said to the whole group, and there may have been a hundred people in the business then, he said, the, the one constant I can assure you going forward as a group is that there's going to be change. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, you, you either got to accept that or you don't. You, I think you're either of that mentality or yes. you've got to learn pretty quickly. And, and that stems from, Again, that sort of elite sports culture. If, if you're not prepared to move with the times and adapt accordingly, at an elite level, you're going to get left behind really, really fast. It's very immediate. <laughs> it's very immediate, right? Yeah, and you're getting judged. You're not even getting judged week to week. You're getting judged day to day, hour yes. to hour, session to session on how are you adapting to be a better person, a, a better individual, a, a, a better team uh, team member. And so those that type of environment, that culture where a vast majority of, of the group are actually excited about change. Yes. Um, within the framework of the business, obviously, or the team. Um, but those that tend to get quite excited and not fearful of change Tend, tend to I think tend to create the the most sort of challenging and sort of the the types of teams that push the boundaries um but, and if you you know you, you relate that to sport which I tend to do hmm. most of those I mean that New Zealand side in rugby terms the New Zealand side that were number one for near on a decade hmm. um everybody else fell foul of trying to be like the All Blacks yeah, of course. The All Blacks are just trying to better themselves mm. week to week, day to day, month to month, whatever it may be. Mm. Rather than these other teams thinking, okay, well, how are we going to? Never mind the All Blacks. How are we going to set the benchmark that is better than anyone else in the world around? How are we going to do this internally? Have that sort of internal aspiration opposed to an external aspiration? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was one of the strengths that we had in 2003. We, I mean, Clive was was absolutely adamant that it didn't matter whether it was the nutrition and diet that you were going through to how fast you were going to run or how much weight you could lift or, you know, the logistics, the hotel, whatever it may be, he was going to say, we're going to do it. We are going to be the best in the world. At. Now, you're not going to be the best in the world at everything, no. But that's what the aspiration very was. Very clear bar, right? It's very clear. Yeah. Um, and, and it sort of flips it around because, yeah, back then in 2003 or previous, maybe 2099, 2000, everybody's looking at the All Blacks thinking, oh, you know, they're still the best team in the world. They didn't win the World Cup, but they're still the best team in the world. Whereas in 2003, everybody was looking at England thinking, what are they doing? How are they yes. got there? Yes. Uh, and so we we sort of flip that around a little bit, and I, I quite like that mentality. And I, and I think subconsciously, a lot of leaders tend to do that. They tend to create their own internal aspiration because they might have a bit of an ego, yes, um, yes, but to the benefit of the team. Um, and you, but you need the team members around you that are going to embrace that type of culture. Yeah, and we're certainly going to need some renewal in the England rugby team as we look forward in the coming months and years. But let's not talk about that. Um, the other England manager, just I mean, you, at the time of recording, you just come back from the semi-final. You obviously, um, you know, Gareth Gareth Southgate has sort of marked himself out as a as a leader. Of show. What's your observations on him in terms of what he's done? Oh, yes, in terms of performance, that's one aspect. But I'm curious about what you see in him because you've worked with lots of different leaders in business and sport. What do you, what do you think distinguishes him? I, I think I think Gareth um, 
Gareth has spent many, many years with a lot of that squad. Um, there is a core of that squad that are are being incredibly successful yeah. that have been around a while. Um, and so therefore he has, the, the, the culture is throughout the spine of the team, whatever that spine may be, but it, it, it's, it's throughout. I think also the, uh, I mean, the, I mean, tiny little details here, but the, the atmosphere around the non-11 is, is very different. Yes. And yeah, he calls them out. He calls them out, doesn't he? He actually yeah. puts his arms around them, literally, and he calls yeah. them out. And it's not, it's not, it doesn't look false. It, it looks real, right? It's well, what, yeah, yeah, and it, it's easy that when I, I was at the semi-final, it's easy to see because they've, they've just realised they're in the final. But on the pitch, when they're all celebrating and there's there's management, there's there's the eleven, the substitutes, the non-substitutes, all up to the twenty-six, whatever players there are. But you could see they were all absolutely buzzing about what they're up to. Apo, you know, there was no, yeah, sort two, of no two teams, two tight, teams, right? lit, tight lipped waving, and everything's all right. Everyone was going completely bonkers, and and they're the little signs where you, everyone has their own little accountability and responsibility within the squad. And I think Gareth has made that absolutely clear, crystal clear to that squad that. Unfortunately, there's only ever going to be eleven going on the on the pitch. Get yeah. yourself over that. Um, you know, to win it, we're going to need twenty six of you. We might only play twenty three of you, but in training or in the preparation, in the analysis, how you you know how the three goalkeepers work together to get Pitford right. You know, whatever it's going to take, you're all going to have uh, an input um, and. I, I I think that gets slightly underestimated how powerful that can be w within teams. Um, That's a great point. That's a great point. I just want to come back to you as we as we draw to a draw to a close. Although I could talk for hours, I won't. Um, if you look back at a much younger version, you're young already, but a much even younger version of Matt starting off in either business or earlier in your elite sport, and you as you've gone through various transitions and changes what advice would you would you give yourself to a 18 year old or a 20 year old in managing the transitions that you've had in life um i i think um I, I was i was a bit of a late developer when it came to um i think to, how i would describe it or just you know, generally growing up um i think i was a boy I was a boy till I was sort of 22, 23. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is, yeah, I was loving playing rugby and having all the good times that an early 20 year old lad should have, but I wasn't necessarily, um, uh, you know, not even half an eye, a quarter of eye, an eye on what's happening in the next decade, two decades. Mm. How do I position myself? How do I, some, I suppose to a, want of a better expression how do i leverage the position that i'm in now yes to then you know now i, I know i've had a bounce of a ball i've you know i've got the job at question of sport i work for the bbc i've i've, I've met a, a couple of brilliant business mentors that have that have sort of supercharged my corporate identity but i i think i would i i i've maybe burnt some bridges yeah, you know, I couldn't tell you which bridges, but I'm sure along the way in my early years, I've that sort of cheeky upstart of a scrum half mm. maybe came out off the field too many times. And, and, and I, I would tell that younger Matt Dawson to be mindful of, um, of that sort of on-field character and off-field character. Um, yeah, that's fascinating that's fascinating you talked about a couple of business mentors there what's the best advice you've received beyond what you said about tim and change what what, what other great advice have you received from your business mentors um well without sounding sort of too cutthroat one of um one of a, one of my good friends said and this was i'm going to say maybe 12 15 years ago um and he said he, he said to me dawes um you seem to be doing all right 
you've got your job at Question of Sport, work for the BBC, um, but you've got 30 odd years to go. You have to get yourself into an environment where you make money in your sleep. Mm. And I, I was like, what? He mm. said, well, you tell me how you make money. And I was, you know, I would describe how, where my finances would come from. And he would just basically say to me, yeah, and do you have to appear there? And I'm not, yeah. And yeah, yeah, there's only one, there's only one of you, Dawson. Yes. Only a finite number of hours in the day, right? And everything was so reliant on on me being there, but but also being mindful that you know your stock is going to decline because things change, you know, and you lucky that you've won the World Cup, but someone else is going to win the World Cup and someone else is going to be the the uh test cap record holder and you know, you're not going to be on Christian Sport forever. And there was this a sudden realization for me that okay, I've got a different perspective on on what type of business um, r- rather than the here and now. It was more mm. of a long term view, and that's sort of where he was. I mean, it was and you diversify crude, and have your it was a crude passive, term, passive but, income. Yeah. yeah, that's great advice. One yeah. thing we you and I share the more personal level is your your son and mine have suffered, I guess, brain illnesses from what I've obviously read. Your son, Sammy, who I think was two at the time, had meningitis and made a full yeah. recovery. My son had an encephalitis, which is slightly different, and now got lifelong disabilities. Um, but he's a lovely, happy boy most of the time. Absolutely. Um, uh, what did you learn personally in that, those moments, particularly the intense moments, about yourself yeah. and life, if you don't mind me asking? No, not at all. Um, no, it was quite a, quite a defining moment of my life. Um because you, you, I mean, you just can't prepare for that. I mean, it, it's not, it, it, no one, you, you don't have a, a mentor for mm-hmm. seeing your children in intensive care and being, you know, talking to a doctor and you're asking the doctor, is he, is he going to survive? And the doctor not saying yes, not saying no, giving you an answer that he has to give you. But, you know, there's, there was so much indecision and, and, um, I, I think I just probably became a little bit more um, philosophical about life in in general. You know, even today when I look at Sammy, who's running around and playing football every single second of his life, and you know, seeing the scars on his wrists and his ankles, which mean nothing to him, but they're they're the reminder for me how fragile it, every everything is. Yes. And, yes. Um, yeah, ma- making the most of opportunities personally and with with the boys is has continued to be incredibly important. As as is my my work life. You know, you, you you've spoken to me about different opportunities and what people sort of um, you know what types of business businesses do you say yes to or no to? Well, again, it, it, I, I'm in a privileged position that I get the opportunity to do the things that I want to do. Uh, yes. And a lot of that has come from the adversity that I've, that I've been through. Um, and certainly, yeah, with, uh, with what we went through with, with Sammy, it brought it into, uh, into the, let's say into the foreground, but it, there, there are lots of reminders mm. for you to not, not get too wrap, wrapped up in your own pretending or pretense of self-importance. That's a lot of wisdom. I couldn't agree with that more. Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure. I loved your candor, your philosophical approach to life. Um, the fact that you can think through and work through what you bring and what you don't bring and where you play and don't play across all the aspects of your portfolio. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned a lot um, and I'm really grateful for sharing your story and where you're going and how you felt along the way. So thank you ever so much. That's a pleasure, David. Thanks for uh, catching up and um... Yeah, but maybe maybe not leave it the, the next sort of 10 years before we see each other again. Indeed, indeed. I appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thank you. That was another edition of Lancefield on the Line.